Mine. Thank you, Hanan. Okay. Now, I'm sure you guys went home and reviewed all the slides and know everything. So, I'm going to... This should work, no? Is it on? Is there a button to turn on? Oh, there is a button. Ah. Can't make the mode control work. Uh, the, oh, it great, thank you. <laughs> Nothing like. I, you went to engineering school? Mm -hmm. You you got an undergraduate in I engineering? I got a PhD in that. <laughs> okay. So. I'm going to go very f fast. Look. So, we started the lecture yesterday um, mentioning uh, three when we talk about no trade result then we talk about uh, three stylized facts um, that one needs to explain in a model in a model like that tries to talk about speculation. The first is that you have these innovations, this technology innovation. There's nothing here in our lectures about that. Uh, with Harrison Hong and Wei Shong, we have a paper on the on the on the subject, but it's not you know it's quite orthogonal to the stuff we're doing here. Um, but then, but there's a lot of empirical empirical. Uh, evidence that of the pure bubbles in terms of technological and financial innovations. Um, the second is that this, this correlation between high prices and trading volume, that's also there's a lot of evidence for that. And the third is the fact that bubble implosions coincide with increase in asset supply. I think that's the most e interesting economic, uh, economic connection because just say, you know, something the economists always say, always talk about. Something is expensive, somebody's going to find a way of producing it, and as they produce, that's going to satisfy demand. Uh, as was mentioned yesterday by Peter, uh, you know, demand and supply, perhaps for good reasons, often don't appear in financial models, uh, although they may be there in a, in a hidden way, as Eric mentioned, you know, that is, because if you have claims to output, in some sense, output influence consumption and so on, but especially for these uh, derivative assets uh, or, or zero supply, net supply assets, they, kind of hard, they, they are hard to explain. Um, so, and that, again, is something that you have a lot of historical observations. Okay? And actually, the Arrow Lecture would, would be about what does happen when you have a decrease in expected supply caused by the death of an artist. And it would be an empirical lecture. It's going to be, we're going to look at auction data to see what it says about prices when that happens. So that will connect to that, but that's not the subject of today's lecture. Uh, this way, right? Or this way? Okay. Uh, and then we, we, we built a model, and the model was able to deliver, this particular model was able to deliver uh, a connection between trading volume, the model I ex exhibited, between trading volume and the size of the bubble. Yeah, well, it could be coming from two things. Of course, the supply, the increase of the asset supply comes from very different ways. We're going to talk today about the idea of shorting. Shorting is like a financial increase in the asset supply. So that's, if you don't see that, it must mean that it's either very difficult, and that's part of the story of the, of the, of the big short, how difficult it was to short uh, mortgage-backed securities, but eventually people figure out a way of doing it. That's, that's one thing. So, the fact that you didn't see it for a long time was a reflection more of the fact that it was very difficult for institutional reasons, we can talk about it in a moment, to, 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 short, to short the stuff. But also you can increase supply just, just like in the South Sea bubble. You can say, look, I'm going to create something like that. 
Now, uh, Guru is going to talk about, about uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, what you see in the cryptocurrency world is exactly that, an incredible increase in, you know, because Bitcoin was kind of, was, had, had high prices, it had a very, a very high, large number of substitutes of being created. Now, how successful the substitutes are, now there's a question of the technology, there's a question of how, how much people are going to adopt the, the alternatives, given they're already using one and so on. But eventually, you you should see that you know, creating a, Gur can talk to, to you about that, creating a Bitcoin light thing, is a zero cost activity because the code exists zero in the sense it's not truly zero, but the code exists. You have to just copy the code which is publicly available and make a small change so you, you can call it Bitcoin B, and uh, so it's you don't expect those things to trade at a very high price unless there's something else going on that we don't fully understand. But, but the, the question gets at an interesting, uh, an interesting idea, which is to what extent can we detect bubbles before <coughs> they burst? Uh, yeah, I agree, I agree. That's a difficult question exactly because, and that's why I kind of try to get out this is an attempt to look at things which are not prices only, because prices are very hard to tell. Prices depend on a model, it depends on something that you know about future, future payoffs and so on. Those are the things I think more stable. And I do think that looking at things like uh, trading volume it kind of helps you do that. It's not 100% diagnostic, but this increase in trading volume that are, are easier to figure out than things like whether the price is too high or too low. The asset supply, I think, is more, is more delicate exactly because um, it takes time for assets. In all these stories, you know, you could see that you took a certain amount of time for people to generate enough of the supply. You know, if, if you remember, you're old enough to remember the internet bubble. Those people were not even born during the internet bubble, probably. But the internet bubble, every company was changing their name to dot com. So, and that you could see, there's a paper on this. If you change your name, if you add a dot com to your name, your prices, went, the price of your stock went up. Now, during the, Bitcoin, during the cryptocurrency bubble, when Bitcoin was selling at, whatever, $15,000, well, how far did Bitcoin go? Close to 20 the big, right? Only 60% away, it's <laughs> only 60% below. Yeah, so it's interesting that when, on, uh, at, the, at that peak, there were companies also that were trying to to change their names to reflect or, or made announcements, they are going to become a blockchain company. Now, the most ridiculous of all of this was something called the Long Island Tea Company. The Long Island Tea Company, as you'd expect, produced tea, presumably in Long Island, <laughs> I'm not sure, but a company that produced tea, and there was a brand, Long Island Tea, Long Island tea. and they announced they are going to become a cryptocurrency, and the stock bump up. <laughs> There's another example with a failed old company, Kodak, which is a great company at some point, but also did the same. Well, you know, first of all, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. The trading volume is very low on Bitcoin. I mean, uh, Gur maybe knows more about, much more about it. Can you say a word about trading, trading on Bitcoin? There are two types of trading. One time is on chain, meaning when I want to pay Jose in Bitcoin, that's recorded and that's available. Another time, if I want to buy the Bitcoin US dollar, the US dollar for Bitcoin, that's off chain. That's And that's that's the one that's be more analogous to what's going on here. If if you're using Bitcoin to pay me, that would not be speculation. I mean, he wants to pay me, and uh, he, he's using whatever means of transaction he had. Uh, we rarely use other assets to do that. It's true, but in principle, you know. If I owe you money and I give you all the Apple shares I own, which are zero, and you forgive my debt, 
uh, you'd be, that's, I wouldn't call that a trade, uh, a trade, I mean, you know, and that's what we're saying, that in the chain you, you're kind of registering just the transactions across yeah. people, yeah, you have to, yeah. Anyway, we're going to learn about, a lot about this stuff, super interesting. Uh, my view of, of this cryptocurrency stuff is that, of course, we have examples of currencies which have, which are pure bubble. If you look in your wallet, if you still carry cash, I know most people, including myself, I rarely carry cash, but I have some cash here in Israel. Uh, so, because I was told that cabs don't accept sometimes uh, credit cards. Uh, in New York, I don't use cash. But when you use cash, you, of course, you're carrying, uh, uh, you, you, you have uh, something that has, that has no backing and gets a positive price. So I suspect that the question is whether or not uh, if you have open competition, you know, but the government has kind of a monopoly on this, right? Only U.S. dollars in the case of the United States, and I suppose shekels in the case of Israel, are legal tender. And only so everybody has to accept in the United States, if you go to a store, they quote you a price, you give them a dollar bill to pay, if it costs a dollar, twenty dollars, if it costs twenty dollars, the store is bound to accept. It's not a it's not a question of choice. Uh, so that's kind of a monopoly enforcement and that keeps the value of these currencies high. Um, whether that would be true for how do you can you sustain a positive price for a private currency? Something Gur may want to discuss during this. Huh? No, it's a difficult, it's a difficult problem uh, uh, to do that. Now, we've had private currencies in the past. The United States had private currencies up to the 19th century even, right? The banks issue private bank notes, private banks issued bank notes that people use. But before the U.S. and the continental, the continental times. In continental times. What he means is after the, before the. After the U.S. won then. Then. We ruled out, yeah. So they established a monopoly on that, yeah. So that's the way we keep some some value for these things. Um, many people believe that it's all going to go away when when uh, we have enough wallets that people would be trading with and so on. But that's a different question. Okay. So that's the first set. And then um, I have one thing I mentioned here, which was I want to emphasize is that the story that's going to motivate the story today. What went on on the CDO market? That in the CDO market, it was very hard to short. And the reason it was hard to short is that how short works on an over-the-counter market, also in, in exchanges often, is that you don't really short in the sense that you create the security. That would be kind of uh, crazy if you could do that. What you do is that you have to find somebody uh, that's willing to lend you that security. So that person lends you the security. You pay that person a fee. Usually it's done through, send, and you send, some, you send some cash to the per person that guarantee that cash has a low interest rate, and that's the fee, that, in, that, takes a lot of, that takes the care of a lot of the fee. And then you have now the security in your hands, and now you can sell it. Okay. Now you're short the security because, of course, you never owned that security that you sold. You're supposed to buy back the security and give back to the, to the original owner. Now, that whole system is complicated by the fact that First of all, there's no centralized exchange. There are countries which have centralized exchange for shorting. In Brazil, there is one. It's centralized. But it's, that's all over the counter. And often, the lender, in the US case, it's an institution, a mutual fund, um, money market fund, somebody who owns that security for, and, and it's in the system, in a sense. Those are the people that have these securities. Now, the CDOs, they were literally th many thousands of them. Okay? So you can imagine the volume, the amount outstanding of each one is fairly small. So if you, the borrower, wanted to his security back, you, you'd have a, sometimes a hard time finding that security again, the same security to give it back. Buy it in the market, the same security, because of the kind of the volume that existed. Now, by law, Many institutions in the United States are regulated so that if they lend a security, they have to keep the right to recall. It's not something that they could negotiate that, but they can't. Okay? So when Fidelity loans somebody who wants to short Apple shares, uh, Fidelity is a mutual fund, that's a mutual fund company, uh, that wants to short Apple shares, and they can say, look, you can keep this for a month. They could say that, but in, in reality, 
they have to they don't can't give up the right to recall so if they have for a certain moment they need these shares for whatever reason because they're selling part of their portfolio whatever they want to do they're, they're, they have the right to recall so that creates a lot of risk for the borrower and it's the risk is bigger when the sh uh, when the amount outstanding is smaller so if I'm if I'm shorting Apple shares there's a lot of Apple shares in the world there's a risk but the risk is relatively small that I'm going to have a a hard time replacing it. If I'm shorting a CDO, it's extremely hard. So what the people who wanted to do that, they kind of went to, it was not really so much regulators, but self-regulating institutions. There's something called ISDA, which is a self-regulating institution of the dealers in the United States. And they went to ISDA and said, we have to create, uh, first they asked for, for, for the creation of a standardized CDS on MBS. What that meant was a way in which you buy or sell insurance on a particular on a, on a, on a, on 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 an MBS. So this CDS exists for bond. They have existed for a long time, and the way they work for a bond is that <coughs> let's suppose that uh, you have a, a bond from 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 a, from a country like Greece, for instance. You're unlucky enough to have bought a country, or you bought a a, a, a Greek uh, bond. Now you worry that Greece is not going to pay you back. So what you can do is that you can go to another party and say, sell me a CDS on the bond, which means I will get insurance on the bond and so that if Greece defaults, I can give you the bond and you give me the money. Now the bond is your problem. Okay, that's how a CDS works. Now that's simple to do in a bond because a bond has a single default event. You, that would hap happen when a bond defaulted. So if a bond, for instance, has a coupon and doesn't pay a coupon, after a certain amount of time, there's rules about that, a default is declared. The bond is in default. So the event is very clear. Even that, there was a lot of, sometimes there was a lot of confusion. There's a lot of lawsuits, but especially Russian bonds. I never understood why there were so many lawsuits about the Russian bonds. That was a 98 default. That was also before you guys were born. <laughs> Uh, but there were a lot of lawsuits involving that. Uh, but, many, but this market exists for a long time, has existed for a long time. Now, an MBS, a mortgage-backed security, is a collection of mortgages. So they don't default all at the same time. Typically, you get the default in one mortgage. So they have to have a rule. What gets paid on that event? No longer, no longer a single default for the whole security. They didn't want the whole security to default if one borrow in Oklahoma defaulted in one house. That didn't seem to be the kind of thing that you wanted because that was going to happen probably if you want, so in a few months, so it's not a very interesting insurance. Uh, so what they did is that they tried to insure, they, so they did this design and then, you know, a CDO, which is just a collection of, of, these, uh, uh, of these MBSs which were trenched, that is in which different people had rights to different pieces of the, of the outcome, then they also created CDS on CDO. Now, you could do the following. You could now have a, a contract with something which is called a synthetic CDO. A synthetic CDO is one that had no mortgages inside it. What it had inside it were CDSs on CDOs. And what they did is, is the following. To give you an idea, unfortunately I didn't bring a, a transparency to this, but remember the famous abacus, okay, that I talked about, that is the, the the uh, SEC case. So how, how those abacus was consisted? They chose a certain number of bonds and these bonds were called the reference bonds to this to the synthetic CDO. So now you have these reference bonds that had been chosen. Now we know essentially by one person who's going to take one side of the of the deal. That's that was the the scandal that Goldman Sachs was involved. But in theory those things had been chosen uh, by a neutral party. That was that was the theory. So they chose the, the, the bonds by a neutral party. And then they'll come to somebody like Eric and say, give me $100 million, Eric, which Eric would write a check for. I'll take the check of $100 million of Eric. And the check of $100 million will go into the, the, into the structure, the synthetic CDO. Now, the $100 million of Eric, I'll tell Eric the following. OK, you're going to get an interest on your $100 million. Is going to be equal to LIBOR. Somebody talked about LIBOR. Daryl talked about LIBOR. So you guys know what LIBOR plus a spread. Okay? 
So it will pay you better than what a bank will pay you if you, if you lend the money to that. A major bank will pay you if you lend the money to that. Because LIBOR is maybe the rates at which banks borrow and lend to each other. Not to people. To people, they pay less even than LIBOR. But just to give an idea. So you get LIBOR plus a little bit. Okay? Um, and in exchange, you're going to receive back the flow of funds that all these mortgages are going to produce. Okay? So Eric is just taking a piece of it. The whole thing was $2 billion. That's Eric's piece, okay? the $100 million. Now, Elhanan, who's a much richer guy, will get the other $1.9 billion. So now we've got $2 billion. So Elhanan has $1.9 billion, and, and Eric has $100 billion. Now, Eric will be protected on the following sense. The first, hundred, the first payments would always go to Eric. Only after Eric got the payments that were due, which was 5% of all the payments, right? Then they'll go to, to Elhanan. So that looks like a pretty safe security. Okay? So he'll give me the money. Elhanan will give me the money. Uh, and then I'll pay these guys LIBOR plus a little bit. But what would be the deal? At the end, every time there was a default, I'll take off. First of all, Hanan, because he's the least protected, the least protected guy. Then from the next least protected guy, in, in reality, there were many, many people. And in the top, there'll be, there'll be Eric, he'll be protected. He'll be paid only if I default on everybody else. Okay? So those, all these different trenches received uh, um, um, ratings, and the vast majority of them were rating AAA or better. So as it happened, these bonds had been chosen by, by a man named John Paulson, who took exactly, the, he was the guy that got the money and kept the difference when there were the defaults. And so he got, he made in this deal, he made something like one point something billion dollars, just as this one deal, because everything defaulted and that was his money now, because Garrick's money and Elhadar's money went to him. So that was the structure they, they figure out. And as I mentioned, the, 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 the amount of that stuff that was, that was created, okay, more than double. So the, 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 let me backtrack a minute. The thing was to transform home equity bonds based on less than prime mortgage and triple AAA rated bonds. Now, it turns out that if a bond was really bad, some bonds are rated as, as bad as C or, or single B, you couldn't do it. No, no matter of correlation assumptions you assume, no matter how many times you, you, you reproduce the thing, which is, you couldn't do it. Okay? So those you, most of the stuff you did with bonds which are either rated triple B or single A. That was the large volume of one, and mainly triple B. Okay? Now, if you don't know what those, how those ratings work, a higher... A higher letter is a worse bond, and then more letters is a worse bond. So the best is triple A, then it goes double A, I mean, it goes the other way around. Less letters is a worse bond. Triple A is the best one risk, double A is the second, then A, then triple B, double B, B, and triple C, etc., etc. Okay? Um, it goes up to D, I think. D means we, we don't rate them. Uh, in any case, so they wanted to transform triple, triple Bs, and there were a lot of those triple B mortgages that were result of subprime loans, triple B mortgage bonds. And so the amount issued, you know, in a period that goes a little bit over a year, okay, before everything blew up, more than double the amount of triple B trenches of those home equity bonds. So you can think about something that you had 100, now you have 200. And as I said, you know, if you have, as, if you have somewhat, if shorting, if this is a form of shorting, if you want to think about it. Because nobody was building houses to make these new bonds like before. The earlier, the earlier bonds, you had to build a house and then make a mortgage and then have a bond. Um, in this case, we're just pure financial financial engineering. There was no real side to it. Now I want to ask you guys a question. This I think is an important policy question. So was it bad that all this financial engineering was done? So you have this bubble. Okay. Then people decided I can create this stuff at zero cost. I don't have to build houses. I don't have to do anything. 
Was it, a, was it bad for the overall economy that that happened? I want some people saying something. It was bad. Yeah? Why? Yeah, no, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the creation of the synthetics. Ah. The creation of the synthetics. So is that a bad idea, the creation of synthetics? Okay. That's one answer, which is, I think, correct. The other, the more stuff you can say about this. What's the other thing you can say? That, I think, is the most important one. You know, part of you know, what you have to think about the bubble, of course, there was all those dislocations which are very important, but there are also an incredible excess supply of housing, houses that nobody wanted to own. Uh, now, you know, 10 years later, people are starting to occupy these houses in Arizona. Some of them are very deteriorated, right? So I think the alternative would have been slower. The bubble would have bursted slower. It wouldn't take just a year, probably take a couple, a few years. But people are building houses like crazy in places like Arizona, where you basically have, you know, infinite land. Okay, so the margin cost. You can see, act, you can see, there's a very interesting, there are two very interesting pieces of data. Uh, you know, another country you had the same um, bubble as the United States about the same time was Spain. And in Spain, have, people have looked at the rate of dropouts in high school increased by a lot. Why do you think that's, that happened? Why did people drop out of high school? To go work on construction, yeah. They're very good wages. People said, why do I have to stay in high school? I can go work and get a good job, right? And they, you can see that in the data. I've never seen something like that for the United States. But for Spain, that's, uh, you, you can see that in the data. And something like that, in the United States, you had another source, which is immigration, which probably kept the wages more, more, uh, but you can also see the increase in prices, you know, the increase in wages and the increase in construction costs in certain areas in the United States. So that's all reflective of use of real resources. People are using real resources to get this done. Go ahead. Right. About what? Right. This is not it, you're saying. This was like making bets. Yeah, no, you're right. But, you know, from a utility point of view, I recommend this paper, which is in this, the reading list here, by Brunmeier, Simsek, and Chong. It's one of the things that they end up reading list. Who really thinks about, they try to think about a problem. It's, it's really a difficult problem to think about how do you think of welfare when people have diverse beliefs. And I think they made a good, a good try at that. Okay. That's a bad, maybe Eric knows another reference than this one. Think about how you think of welfare and the diverse beliefs. But, yeah, yeah. So you should look at that paper, see who else refers to them. Because that's a ni nice thing about Google Scholar. Now you can find who else uses this stuff. It's a well-cited paper, so you find a bunch of citations. Many of them may be irrelevant, but there may be some newer results which are interesting, some new stuff. Anything else? Okay, so that's where we are. So now I want to tell you, so that motivates. I'm not going to explain why, how all those things, uh, you know, why the bubble appeared and not other bubbles. I think it was, part of it is the, is the, is, is the fault of people like Daryl, he's gone. <laughs> and me, people, or, or Gore, people that work in finance, because we kind of kept saying that financial engineering had really reduced risk, right? You could now make risk, make control risk much better. And that probably whetted the appetite for a lot of, a lot of institutions, you know, banks and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, mutual funds, et cetera, for risks that they thought was very much under control. Okay? Uh, 
uh, which we now know they weren't. So this is part of the, I would say, the ideology of this whole development of the market. And, and, and explain to us um, what I like to call this chain of optimisms that kept financing. You know, you need people to be optimistic, so they may, must think, you know, this is probably a good business, and if it goes wrong, I can do something about it, right? So the German lenders bank who put on Abacus, there was a single German lenders bank that put $400 million and walked out to zero. So that was, that was, it's very, the return is pretty bad, was pretty bad. So that was just an abacus. Uh, then, I forgot the name of the bank, it's a regional German bank. Uh, so these guys were probably thinking, you know, well, one or two things, this is pretty good, pretty safe investment, a triple A bond, et cetera. And it goes wrong, I, I can, I know how to, you know, I'll get some signal, I'll be able to hedge, I'll be able to do something. Of course, they weren't able to do anything, they lost everything. So you create this, you know, you're able to, to support this chain of optimism, which is not just ideas or beliefs, but also the belief that you could deal with the situations if they got worse, which I think was a large part of what was going on here. People kept saying, you know, we now understand we're in this new world in which people can really control risk. And uh, uh, so that's what I, so, but what I want to talk about is talk about how you think about shorting in a model of dynamic trading, okay? And that's kind of a diff, uh, I mean, it has been a problem that has um, challenged, at least for me, it was a challenging problem. Um, this is work I done, I've done with Marcel Nutz. Marcel Nutz is, a, is in, the, in the mathematics department and statistics, math and statistics at Columbia. And um, it's rather technical, but what I, what I think about, what's nice about the, tech, the, the technical stuff here is that I think they can use in a wide, for a wide set of problems. So those are techniques which they're not always, they're not always um, used by economists or not often used by econ economists, but they're very useful, I think, to analyze dynamics in general. I want to talk a little bit. So do, today I'll do a little bit more technical stuff than I did yesterday. Uh, that is, I'll go through some of the proofs and so on and tell how you, you do this stuff. All right. Also, the model can be used to illustrate the effect of increasing supply, although the supply is exogenous. As a last thing before I go into the model, I want to tell you that this whole dealing, I talked to you guys all, all this increase in supply and so on, modeling this stuff, I think there's very little done on that. Okay. So what has been done is, what's the impact if supply increases? But the increase in supply in different situations is a, is a um, nobody has been, been, been able to write interesting models about that but how financial assets, I think that's general in finance in general, right? We don't have very good models of how, why is it that people do more, one, start producing more stuff in finance, more assets in finance, they take the short position in finance, and even less, why do they actually increase the supply, the actual supply of the assets, if the assets are, as, as Eric was thinking about, assets that, are, that correspond to real, to, to real wealth. So we usually think about, you know, the output decision. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. This is a cheat in the model. I think it's a great cheat. It's not an original cheat because if you look at all this literature, I'm sure that Daryl covered some. Peter has contributed to some of this literature too. This literature on uh, on trading of, of, of assets by, you know, where you have that, that uh, where you have people with different margin utilities for the asset, right? Uh, they have a name for that literature, search literature, the search literature, right? In that search literature, they use the same cheat, which is you have somewhere to produce a cost of holding the asset or a benefit of holding the asset. doesn't really matter if you call it cost or benefit. Okay? So the way people think about that, now uh, I'll talk about art. In, in art, you can think about the benefit being the, having the painting in your wall. Although, as I'll argue on Sunday, a lot of art is traded, has, people don't even look at their art because the art is in warehouses. I'll, I'll give you some, some facts about that, which is super interesting. So a lot of this expensive art never shows up. Okay? Nobody knows where this famous uh, Leonardo that sold for 400 million to the, possibly to the, to the Saudi prince, 
right? Nobody knows who owns it. Nobody knows where that stuff is. And it's unlikely that we're going to know. Maybe we will. Huh? Well, that's, that's what I was starting to worry. Because as you know, the, the French, the Louvre, is doing a giant exposition on Leonardo because of 500 years. And, you know, he lived in France a, 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 a long part of his late life. And so they're doing a huge Leonardo. And they refused. Apparently, I mean, that's the room. They were offered that painting, and they refused it because they're not going to hang, and they say they don't, they're not sure of the authenticity. Now, if I was, you know, this was sold by Christie's, right? It was Christie's who was sold. If I was one of the directors of Christie's, I, were, I would worry at this point. <laughs> you know, but that's what it is. So here's the cheat. The cheat is to assume there's a cost of holding the stuff, either if you go short or going long. Now, in this cost of holding, I'm, I'm thinking about the actual opportunity cost, maybe cash and so on. Like in the search literature, I need some kind of nonlinearity, so I think that's some increase. So it may be the cost for you, your capital costs go up. As you hold more stuff, you're spending more money, and your interest rate that you face goes up. That's quite reasonable. Maybe when you go short, the same thing is happening because you have to give money to in exchange. But it may be also that you worry about you know, the recall risk, etc. I'm not going to say what this is. Just introduce this cost of carry. And this cost of care is going to be quadratic, okay, but with different coefficients for being short and being long. And the idea that it's written this way just to make the math simple. So instead of writing the cost, you write the inverse of, you have a coefficient that, is, that, is, is, is propor that gives you an effect on the inverse of the cost. Okay? Um, so we want to think of larger holding costs for shorts, which means alpha minus is less than equal than alpha plus because the coefficients are really one over alpha minus and one over alpha plus. Okay? So that's the one thing you have to remember. Okay? Uh, the important thing is the margin of valuation is decreasing function of holdings. That's what all this literature needs. You need your marginal value for a unit of the asset goes down. Okay? Now that could come from risk aversion, for instance, but then the math will be much more complicated. So this is what you do. So, I call this cheap risk aversion for this reason. It's like risk aversion, but much easier to do mathematically. Um, uh, supply matters. It appears in the literature of search frictions. The supply here is going to be exogenous, as I said. You look at the earlier literature where I discuss the stuff that comes out of the Harrison and Krebs model. That corresponds to an infinite cost of going short. Shorting is forbidden. That means alpha minus is zero. Remember, it's the inverse, right? So one over zero is infinity. And then... No cost, no increasing marginal cost of going long. You could have constant cost, which is the interest rate. We're going to have that in the model too. Um, and that we have alpha plus equal to infinity. So that's the earlier literature, right? And we're going to let alpha minus and alpha plus have different values. Now, what I'm going to do is going to be, I'm going to characterize the equilibrium solution of a PDE. That gives the existence uniqueness of the equilibrium. I'm going to show that whenever shorting is costly, so you can short cost, the resale option has value. Remember I talked to you about the resale option. I buy something, I acquire the option to resale. That's valuable, provided shorting is costly. I don't have to have, like in Harrison and Krebs, and the literature that followed it, it's not necessary to assume that shorting is ruled out. Provided shorting is costly, in this sense, there's an increase in marginal cost, it's always going to have value. Huh? Partial differential equation. Sorry. Sorry, I should have said. Okay. Uh, now, if going long has zero carrying costs, there's alpha plus is infinity, and it's cost is to go short, the price is going to be independent of the cost of going short. So as soon as you have, I'm going to show that to you. So the delay option has no value here. You don't have a value to delay. You, you, when you're trading, you don't want to delay. Why? Because uh, you're going to show that in this case, the delay value is going to have no value. So the crucial assumption, the early literature, is not no shorting like we had before, but shorting is costly and the marginal cost of going long is constant. We're going to show that too. Okay. And then I'm going to compare the equilibrium price to price when agents can only buy at time zero and hold to maturity. And I'm going to identify the difference as the value speculation. Um, I'm going to show that even in shorting is not allowed, as soon as you have an increase in cost of going long, uh, 
there is examples. I'm not going to go to the example. I argue why these examples are possible. This delay option may dominate the resale option, and that's going to result in a negative bubble. We're gonna, we can get a negative bubble just from the fact that there's an increase in cost of going long. There's some results in the literature. I put it here so you guys can find these results in, literature, in search costs literature that have some of the same flavor. And finally, if I have time, I'm going to show how the equilibrium solves an optimization problem faced by a plan that will leave the instruments. That gives a nice interpretation to the equilibrium. OK, so here's how it's going to work. There are going to be types. There are going to be n types, as opposed to two types, as in the previous model, each with a unit measure of agents. So there's the same number of agents of each type. And they trade a security over a finite time interval between 0 and t. It's going to be a security that gives a payoff at time t, cap t. So there's a single payoff, which is a function of a state variable, xt. Okay. The agents, again, are going to agree to disagree on the evolution of x. And here's going to be what's happening. So you've seen this boundary motions. You've seen these diffusions before. The agents disagree on the drift. And they may even disagree about on the volatility. Now, there's a lot of discussion if people can disagree about volatility. In a continuous time model, you could figure out by looking at data the volatility at that point perfectly. Right? Um, however, the world is much more complicated than that. We're not thinking about nothing here depends on disagreements on volatility. You can assume that all the volatility is the same. None of the examples depend on this. All the examples are done with the same volatility. So I'm not going to waste time on this, but it's kind of an interesting literature right now. It's mostly associated with a mathematician named Peng, but then uh, in China. But then there's a lot of people in statistics, and there are some economists like Lars Hansen who have been working on the idea that looking at models where people disagree about volatility. So there's a big. Uh, I'm not going to to uh, also Epstein of the same Epstein of Epstein and Zinn has written a couple of papers where people disagree about volatility. Uh, I'll lay that uh, there. Now, I'm going to make enough assumptions. It's everything on the slide, so we have a unique solution, OK? Enough smoothness assumptions and so on. More importantly, uh, non-degeneracy of the matrix sigma. OK. So all right. So uh, I'm going to assume that the agents are all risk neutral, and they have access to a risk-free asset whose interest rate is normalized to 0. So that's just a normalization in this case. You could take a constant interest rate would make no difference. Um, and they trade the security through the interval 0t at a price p of t that's determined in equilibrium. So the equilibrium is the determination of the, of the asset price. OK. Now, we're going to have some condition on portfolios that agents can have. So agents, a portfolio for an agent is the amount of the stuff. There's only one asset. So that's it, their portfolio. We're interested in it. OK. So phi of t will be the number of securities. When it's negative, it's a short position. OK, up to here? That's all we have. OK. Now, given a price process that has some properties, mathematical properties that we don't have to discuss here, they are there, and you can see in books what they mean. What is the agent expect to pay off? What's the agent expect to pay off? OK. First of all, agent I use a different expectation. That's why the expectation is indexed by I. OK. And how, how much money he's going to make? Well, he's going to make, first of all, he's going to make money out of gains from trade. Right? Every, time, every point in time, depending on his position, if the position is positive and prices go up, he makes money. If the position is positive and goes, if prices go down, losses. You get losses. Okay? But he's also going to have to pay the cost of carry of the asset. Okay? So depending on the position, there's a different cost of carry. Is that okay? Right. Now, the different probability measures are going to be because I'm going to have to have an optimist and pessimist. People are going to have different views. So the way to think about it, I mean, if you think that everybody agrees about the sigma, the optimists are going to be the guys with big positive Bs. And the pessimists are going to be the guys with big negative Bs, with negative Bs. Now, there's always a question of relative optimist and pessimist. They could all, be all, all think the stuff is going to go up, but some people are going to think it's going to go up by more. Some people are going to think they're going to go up by less. Then you have optimistic impact. So, is there a belief about the capital T or is there a belief about the capital T? 
uh, they disagree on everything because after all they know the whole diffusion right they, they have a different diffusion so forgetting about this term you know you today they know x of t today they know what x of t is but lo locally they already disagree about where x of t is going to go because the price is going to depend on that and the trading strategy is going to depend on that The probability measures are common knowledge, yeah. 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 But you ignore them. Yeah. Well, I don't update. Yeah. But I need to know Chose's beliefs so that I can predict. Well, there's a sense we're going to talk about that. All you have to know is what equilibrium It's all this rash expectation stuff, okay? But how am I going to calculate the equilibrium unless I know your. That's the point. In rational expectations, people don't calculate what equilibrium is in a sense, right? I mean, they, they imagine this price and happens to be cons and that it's consistent. Now, checking the consistent, you're absolutely right. I mean, but it's all this idea that in, 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 we never came up. I, I don't think we ever solved that problem, even in a rational expectation world. How do we know what the equilibrium price is? Now, if I assume everybody is like me, if I am on this, uh, you know, there was a great psychoanalyst named Lacan. And he was very interested in this question, how people self-reflect, you know, the two personalities. It's more, it's more schizophrenic than that, because you think about the two people, the two parts of the person. But in any case, how they reflect with each other and arrive at consensus. So maybe that's what we do. The F. The F, there is a supply. So there's a supply, the supply, there's so many units out there which are available. But we can create more because we can short, so in a sense, people could be long more than what's available. No, of course, but I mark a capital, my, 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 this is just a way, I don't have to trade, but it doesn't really re matter, right? You can, as was used before, you're going to mark to market. So your position, your value of your wealth, you don't have to trade. You, have, you never have to sell anything. But eventually, cap T comes, and at that time, you got to pay off. Or, okay? No. You cash in the stuff. F of, you get F of XT, whatever X of T is. So you don't have to trade. In fact, trading is going to be a choice. PMS in the end, but you can calculate that by saying, I want to know how much money I lose between today or a gain. Let's be optimistic. Right? Between today and the end of the year. I could say how much money I'm going to make between today and tomorrow, how much money I'm going to make between tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, and add it up. Yeah, paper, right? Huh? It's, it's paper. It's some paper. It's some paper, but it doesn't, yeah. The number of units you hold. Yeah. Now you're saying that's that's the question of the Brownian motion, right? I need oh, okay. 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 see the things like in Black Shoals. Okay. Sure, so discrete time. You're absolutely right. You had to account for the changes and fight and this, but these terms vanish when you. Okay. Um, supply is ended by third parties. Is, uh, we don't have a treatment of the endogenous supply. And the equilibrium is a P, it has to have two problems. First, it's kind of a non arbitrage assumption. The last day, the last moment, the price has to be the payoff. Otherwise, you know, what could it be? But once you know that, uh, you want supply equal demand. Supply equal demand. <laughs> Where you say supply equals demand, and you always write demand equals supply. Okay? So that's it. So the demand, remember, everybody is unit size, so they are the same size. So I just have to add up the position of each type. And once I add up the position of your type, that should be equal to the supply. Is that okay? So that's going to be true at every point in time. Huh? Is the supply? Yes, I, I maybe I have forget. In fact, it's a Markovian process. Depend on the same XT at on time. So it varies with time and varies with XT. Why is the you could, it could remain constant. That's just a question of generality. In fact, most of the examples we have, they are constant. 
But you may want to think about, yeah, OK, all the examples. I think we have their constant. So that's, that's what it is. So now the one thing you have to remember is this. We're going to think about Markovian equilibrium. So a price that only depends on time and the state. Okay? That's what we're going to prove existence. There may exist non markovian It's always in this, in this literature sometimes. There may exist complicated equilibria. Depends on what the value was yesterday. Depends. But we're, I'm not sure. I don't think those things exist here. But we're, we're not really, we, I have not looked at this with the we did in detail. So I'm going to look for this Markovian equilibrium. It's just like what people do in a lot of models in economics. You have a Markov process. And then you assume the prices only depends on the, market, the value of the Markov process and time. Okay, and the one thing you have to remember, that's the one piece of math I'm sure you all know, is Ito's lemma. Who, who here has never seen Ito's lemma? You need to be, you've never seen Ito's lemma. That's something, it's an important piece of education. <laughs> Ito's lemma, you know. Or, or as I like to call Professor Ito's lemma, because I once met him, once. <laughs> uh, so, and that says the following. If you give a function v that depends on time and x, how do we compute the instantaneous, the expected value of the instantaneous change? And that's what Ito's lemma tells you. First, you see how much is the function going to vary with t. That's obvious, right? If it's going with t, you're going to get a positive drift. It's going to go up. Then you say, what is the change of the function as a function x multiplied by the drift? Okay. By the way, those are vectors, so but it's just in the product of two vectors. And then you have to correct for that the volatility. So you take the product of the volatility matrix with the matrix of partial second partial derivatives of V, calculate its trace. Remember, it's the sum of the diagonal elements and multiply by half. When I think in one dimension, which is enough for most of what we're doing here, okay, in one dimension, that just sigma square v double prime times a half. Okay, so that's it those lambda. Are we okay? Everybody's okay with this? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Right. Other people's views, yes. Exactly. I think there's something like that, but I haven't looked at it, okay? But it's an interesting thought, yeah. I haven't thought of that, but it's an interesting thought. And it would be especially important, uh, yeah. As people, this is going on in the model. As people start shorting, right, it becomes more expensive. Their position becomes expensive, absolutely, which is true in reality, in a sense. You probably worry, in, this, in terms of this mod, you worry more about a short squeeze. OK. Now, let's compute the gains from trade, OK? Which I've already given you a formula here for all your gains from trade, right? So we call that P uh, is going to have a portion which is going to be, a f the P is going to be a diffusion because it's a function of x and t. So you can use Ito's lemma if you think the, pr the price is smooth, which will prove to be. You can use Ito's lemma to, conf to, to characterize the diffusion of P. So P is going to have a drift and a volatility. Right? Now it turns out that the part of P that is dW, what's the expected value of that? What's the expected value of some x dW, the integral of x dW has? expected value of zero, right? That's the martingale part of, of the chain. So that doesn't, doesn't do anything to the expected value. So all that matters is exactly what's the drift of P, which is given by this operator, L, I, of V. Okay? That's all that matters. And of course, minus the cost. That's the, that's, that's the way you can compute the expected, your expected gains. So that's, that's what they are. Are we OK? And now we're going to use the fact 
that to ma you want to maximize this integral. You can maximize it point by point. You don't have to worry about the integral. You maximize it point by point. So at every instant, you choose the amount to, tr to hold. And the amount to hold should satisfy the expected price change should be equal to the marginal cost of holding the position. Is that clear? So your marginal cost of holding the position, buying a position, let's suppose you want to go long. And you want to go long, and you decide, I want to go long 10 units. And then you ask why I want to go long exactly 10 units. I know the answer. It must be because you, your marginal cost of holding that 10th unit, the last unit that you're holding, has to be equal to your expected gain. Otherwise, what would you do? What would you do if the marginal cost was smaller? I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry? No, I say it's analogous to the literature. The assumption is analogous to the literature in the search frictions. They make the same assumption. That's how I said. I was trying to excuse myself for the assumption. Okay. So, so that is the that is this equality. Okay, is that clear? So everything when you buy, you 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 thinking, I can hold it just for an instant. That instant, how much money I'm going to make? Or well, I'm going to make this much per unit. I want that to be equal to my marginal cost. If this was bigger than the marginal cost, what would I do? I buy more stuff because the marginal cost is until I satisfy that. If this was smaller than the marginal cost, if the marginal cost is larger, I would just buy less. Okay, so that's the important equilibrium condition. Okay, so you get an equilibrium holding premium for type I, which is generated by the holding cost. The holding cost gives you an equilibrium holding premium. So you expect to make money if you're long, you expect to make money on it, and if you're short, you expect the position to deteriorate also, but also you're going to make money. So there's always a holding premium. Okay. Now, how do you solve this? Remember, this is quadratic. That's one thing everybody knows how to take the derivative, right? And the reason we put the alpha plus and the alpha minus at the denominator, the half goes away with the, the marginal cost, and now you have one of alpha plus, so you're simply going to hold alpha times the sign that you have. So suppose you want to go long, you're going to hold, if this number is positive, you're going to hold alpha plus times this. That's going to be your position. If this number is negative, you're going to hold alpha minus times this of short position. So that's just the solution of maximization. That's just pure, simple algebra. Okay. This is simple, even by Peter's. No, not even by Peter's standard, but my standards. <laughs> much simpler than Peter's. All right. Okay. So let me give you, I want to go through examples, two examples, I think, that tell the whole story. And then the theorem is just a very complicated thing, but... Yes. It is, we deal with it. It's here. So here's exactly what that says. Look, your position is like this. So what happens when Li is equal to zero? If this is zero, it doesn't really matter which alpha you take. Your position is going to be zero. So uh, there's no problem with the kink. But it's, you're correct. I should have observed that. It doesn't really matter. The kink doesn't really matter. In fact, it's alpha plus in one side, alpha minus the other side. Exactly at zero, you get both. All right, so now we're going to go through an example, and I want your help, okay? Without your help, I won't do it, okay? So it's a very simple example. You can think of this stuff as being on the line if you want the x. It doesn't make nothing changes because of that. And we're going to think everybody has the same drift, everybody has the same volatility. Everybody agrees. Let's figure out what the price would be. What would be the price if everybody agrees about everything, okay? Okay, now... First thing is that I'm going to call long is an abuse of language, but doesn't matter here. If you hold a position which is non-negative, okay, that's just so they can talk fast. So in equilibrium, everybody has to be long, and this has to be greater than equal to zero. Why? Because I assume the supply to be positive or non-negative. Supply is at least zero; it cannot be negative. The exogenous supply. I said that that was in the slide. So if the supply is non-negative, they have to hold a position which is greater than equal to zero. That's the first thing. So we know what the position will be. It will be exactly alpha plus Li. Okay. That's the position they're going to hold. We know from the optimization, when you hold a positive position, that's where you are. But you have market clearing. Market clearing says there are n types. They're all holding this position phi, which is the same for everybody. 
that should be the supply. Okay? All right. Now, let's take this equation here. Okay? Divide by alpha plus to this side. And write what Li is longhand. So Li is the derivative with respect to time, the derivative with respect to x times bi, which is the same for every i. You just can choose one i to do everything. Everybody is the same. A half times this volatility, which again is the same, okay? That should be equal to n times phi i should be equal to s. So I get the term s divided by n now. Okay, equal to zero. So you look at this equation, says the form. You can think of the supply as being kind of a running cost. That's how, he, there's a problem that Merton solved many years ago, which has this characteristics. So you're thinking of this as the cost of holding this stuff, okay? And what matters here, uh, the equilibrium price has to rise to compensate for this cost of holding. And what's going to be your cost of holding? This S for everybody, you have to hold S over N, your marginal cost, and then you divide by alpha plus to get to the cost, your marginal cost. So that's simple, what you get here. So that's what you get when everybody is the same. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Yes, we have in the paper we talk about that. We could have we could have heterogeneous cost. Then you have to average the cost in some way. Not in this example, of course, because to make everybody yeah, this. Yeah. Exactly. If. Everybody has homogeneous beliefs? No. Uh, yes, yes, everybody holds. Uh, I'm not the sure. highest cost, if, if it holds epsilon, if this cost is still lower than the next question. That's what I'm yes, you have to get a. Get the, the, margin cost of the marginal cost about everybody. Exactly, exactly. So then everybody's going to hold something. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, okay, any more questions? Any questions? Because there's a supply. How could it be an equilibrium where everybody holds anything? Nobody holds anything. Huh? Sorry? Yes. Yes. So I see what you're saying. So thinking about a case where you get a price of zero, you could get a price of zero in excess supply. It doesn't happen in this model. But it could happen. No, it doesn't happen in this model because, wait a second. No, it could happen in this model. If everybody's very pessimistic, nobody's going to want to hold everything, anything. So I should have phrased an equilibrium which, which there is no excess supply, that's true. You're absolutely right. Okay. Now I'm going to go to the first one, the disagreement. So I'm going to take two types. I'm going to make them disagree about the drifts, but have the same volatility. Okay, so that's the example I want to go. I'm sorry? For for constant supply, yes. For you know, this looks, yeah, you, this looks like the price is going to have to rise at a constant rate. That's like your your stuff. Your supply constant is going to be like your stuff. The price is going to have to hold at a constant rate. Yeah, because you know this will be a constant, and that's what price is going to have to rise on average. On average, it's going to have to. Of course, there is exactly. You expect the price has to go has to. That's enough. No, that's enough. Yes, it's a secondary equation, but you know it's a backward equation, right? So you start there and come to it just like like Black Scholes. You all only need a terminal condition to come back. Uh, of course, you have the whole boundary. Not it's not an ODE here. Right? Okay. Uh, so now we're talking about disagreement about drifts. So I'm going to, to make it simple, I'm going to make uh, an asset in zero net supply. So this one is never going to be an excess supply. We're going to look at this example in zero net supply. Okay, so one type must be weakly long, and the other type must be weakly short. You know, weakly, I mean, it could be zero, right? So they could be both hold zero. That would give an equilibrium. Or if one is long, the other has to be short. Okay. Now, what does that mean? If the first type wants to go short, I mean, here including zero, that's why you get less than weekly short. The other time must be weekly long. Okay? And supply should be equal to demand, but supply is zero. 
and the demand is the sum of those two terms. If this type wants to go long, then the other type must be willing to go short, and again, you have to get supply equal demand. Um, now, we know that, we stop at, we stop at 11, that's what I thought. We know that alpha minus is less than equal than alpha plus. Remember, those are inverse costs, so going short is more expensive than going long. That's, that's the idea. So that if I take this equation here and replace the alpha minus and switch the alpha minus and the alpha plus, so I make this guy multiply by alpha plus. So I take a negative number and multiply by alpha plus. But alpha plus is a bigger number. I multiply the negative number by a bigger number. That's going to make that number smaller. Okay. And I multiply the positive number by alpha minus, which makes that number bigger, smaller. Sorry. Smaller, because it's positive. I'm multiplying by smaller number. Makes so both terms become smaller, so that the inequality holds. The same thing for the other case. So we end up with this equation that says the maximum between alpha minus L1 and alpha plus L2, and alpha plus L1 and alpha minus L2 has to be zero. So now I divide by alpha minus plus alpha plus, that's just a normalization, and get an equation like this. It says, I put all, notice the following. Because I assume that signals are the same, and because the derivative with respect to t is the same for everybody, nobody disagrees that time is not like an Einsteinian thing, an Einsteinian Newtonian that disagree how time goes. Eric could tell you about that. Uh, they all agree on how time goes. Uh, so the terms on time, that's why I divide by alpha minus plus alpha plus. Once I divide by alpha minus by alpha plus, it gets the same term. The terms on the, on the volatility are the same, but the terms on mu, you get a nonlinear term. Okay, you take the maximum between two things. Okay? I don't want you guys, you guys don't have to go through the details. The important thing is that this third term here, when I choose a different group to go short, changes the value only of this term. These two terms are independent of who goes short, who goes long. Okay? So the equilibrium assignment produces an equality. So the, the equilibrium makes this thing as big as possible, which is zero. This term is zero. Otherwise, I'll get a negative number. So I'm kind of looking around, so it's like, that's what's called, that's what called a nonlinear partial differential equation, because the previous equations are all linear. Um, the derivatives just appear multiplied by certain constants, but now no, now you have to take the maximum between two terms and that introduces a nonlinearity. Okay. It's easy to express its sufficiency. Uh, we got a disagreement about drifts cause a nonlinearity in the first order term. If you disagree about volatility, you cause a nonlinearity in the second order term. So how do you do that in general? I don't want to go through the math, through all those terms and so on. But really what it is is this. You have to choose a group to go short. Okay? Every point you examine, which guy should go short? Which groups should go short? Out of all the n groups, you say which ones should go short? The other ones are going to be the complement, are going to go long. So that's what the, the differential equation has to choose at every point. Okay. So the interpreter I go short, then you form this weighted average, just like we formed before. I won't go through the details, it's not important. And then what you do is that you take the max, the assignment, the, the, the equilibrium is given by considering all the possible groups as a function. So when you consider all the gro possible groups and you take the supremum over all the possible groups, you get the zero. All the other guys give you a negative guy. So you're kind of maximizing. This, the equation, the equilibrium equation, tells you you have a, a partial differential that has a term that involves maximizing over all assignments possible. Okay. So there's a lot of things you can prove. Among them, it's kind of obvious the following. If I double... There could be multiple eyes. Right. The solution is unique, right. but that right. doesn't mean that the equilibrium, there could, could be multiple, multiple equilibrium, groups. multiple groups that are assigned, right. yes. There could be, by coincidence, there could be multiple groups assigned to be short or, or long. Um, you could, that could. But I, I assume that's 
that's a very, yeah, that's not, but it doesn't play any role in the sense that you, you're just worrying about the value. They, they both would get to give the same value to this term. Because this is, if you look at the equilibrium price, this is given to you. And all the, all the things have to make this plus this equal to zero. So all the good assignments. Exactly. And all the other assignments make it negative. Uh, for those who are interested in this stuff, as far as Marcel knows, is a novel form of, of, a, of a Hamilton, you know, uh, Darrow talk, uh, talked about Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, so this is a novel form. So that hasn't appeared before, but it's very natural for this problem. One thing you can see is the following. If I double the, if I half the cost of going short and half the cost of going long, which means a double alpha minus and double alpha plus, because they are the inverses, and then I double the supply, I get the same solution. That's kind of expected. Okay, so all that matters is, is the supply relative to what alpha minus and alpha plus are. That can be seen from the formulas of the coefficients, which are there. Um, so I'm going to give you a sketch of this proof. No, I'm not going to give you a sketch of this proof. I'm going to give you the, another proof I'll give you a sketch, which I think is more interesting. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to try, what I'm going to argue with you, here's, there's a proof, the proof, the sketch of the proof is fairly simple, basically uses Zito's lemma and, and uh, this, this maximization stuff that we did. But I'm more interested in teaching you guys about, un, about uniqueness, because uniqueness uses a mathematical tool which is extremely useful, both to prove uniqueness, but more importantly to prove Comparative statics results. Economists live of comparative statics results, right? Most of the question we ask is a question. If I change something, what happens to the solution? Now, we've learned how to do that since, I think, first year micro, right? Where people shift supply and demand curves and says, well, the supply curves get shifted, prices go up or down, depending which direction you shift, the demand curves get shifted and so on. And there's a lot of interesting problems like that. Now, this is a class of problems where you want to do that. You want to consider change in, in parameters, but you're solving a partial differential equation and, a, and, a, and something that looks fairly complicated. Okay? And you look at all these coefficients here, all these formulas for coefficients and so on. But in fact, life is much easier than that. And I tell you why life is easier than that in this world. Something called the comparison principle. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the comparison principle for differential equations? That's something we don't teach. I, when I used to teach early in my life, I taught mathematics for economists very early in my life. Eric must have taught that too, right? When you study, you never taught it, right? So I taught a course like this, and I never taught comparison principles. And then uh, now I know everybody goes through this training course in the beginning of economics, right? Most universities have a, a course you have to take before you. Princeton had one. I think you still have it, right? Yeah. I never saw it, but huh? Harvard has one. I doubt that they teach comparison principles. So, but it's a very useful thing, it's a very good tool, and I would rather teach that for you. So think of a PDE, which is, you can write the PDE as being a function of the function that you put in for the solution, uh, in this case our function V, and some parameter beta equal to zero. That's your, that's your, that's the, uh, uh, very shorthand for a PDE, or for a lot of equations, but a PDE in particular, okay? Now, <clears throat> suppose you have a solution that satisfies a boundary condition. Remember, we have to have a boundary condition. The boundary condition is common. As I'm going to change parameters here, I'm not going to change the payoff function. All I'm going to change is going to be the parameters of, you know, that determine the cost or maybe the supply, something like that. I'm going to change those things, okay? Optimism, pessimism, whatever. I can change whatever parameter. I don't want to change the boundary condition. So all, for all values of the parameter, I'm going to consider the exact the same boundary because the same payoff. Changing payoffs is more difficult, okay, although there are tools for that too. Okay. I'll call V1 a super solution. If when I put V1 in the equation, in this equation here, I put a function V1, okay, I get a number which is less than or equal to zero. For, the, for the, that particular beta. That's called a super solution. By the way, we should call that a sub solution, but the, I cannot go to the reason why that's called a super solution. It's very long. It's the history of mathematics. The fact that 
mathematicians usually minimize stuff instead of maximizing stuff. It goes back to that. <laughs> so our equations are all flipped. We think of maximization, all have the, the, the reverse sign of the way mathematics does. So if you want to follow mathematics, you have to call this a super solution. Okay? So it's a super solution that's less than equal to zero. And a sub solution is something which is greater than equal to zero. Okay? That's a natural thing. Now, equations like this, and when I call equations like this, are equations that have this positive second order term. Okay, this positive definite second order term. Uh, so they are differential equations that involve a second order term that has a positive, positive definite sign. Okay? Equations like this satisfy what's called a comparison principle. That's what Fleming and Sa Sonner, for instance, this reference gives you this comparison principle. Well, so that guarantees that any, any super solution dominates any subsolution. Now think of that, what that says about uniqueness. Okay. Uniqueness says, well, suppose you had two solutions. Right? So solution one, solution two. Since there are two solutions, they have to be both be super solutions and sub solutions. If every super solution has to dominate every sub solution, they each must dominate each other. How can two functions dominate each other? They have to be the same function. So uniqueness is very cheap. But more importantly, as we're going to show you, this is really very good for, and I will argue, and I'll give you some intuition why results like that have to be true. In fact, you can go home and prove a result like that by yourself. I'm going to give you enough uh, to do that. Okay? So here's the heuristic proof of the fact that every super, super, sub every super solution dominates every sub-solution. An heuristic proof. Yes, that second order term has to be positive. Yeah, that's it. So here's the proof. You guys can do it at home. You can do this at home. Okay? Assume to the contrary that V1 doesn't dominate V2. Okay? And look at the function V2 minus V1. I'm going to make a lot of assumptions to make things simple, but that's how you do it at home. Otherwise, you have to look at many pages of proof and find it and so on. Okay? And assume it assumes this function V2 minus V1 is positive somewhere, right? And let's as assume that it assumes a maximum. It has to assume somewhere a maximum because it's going to end up being zero at the boundary, right? It's zero at the boundary, so now it's positive somewhere. I'm going to assume that it assumes a strict maximum where all the first order and second order conditions are going to hold strictly to make my life easy. Okay. So there's a point where it assumes a six maximum. We know it's an interior point. It cannot be at the end because at the end the two functions are the same. And now it's positive. Okay. And now, take the assignment that is the optimal assignment at that point. Remember, we're always assigning, taking the super of all i, but that's going to depend on the function that you put here, right? For that point and on the point, t bar, x bar. So I'm going to take the optimal assignment for the maximization problem for v2. So I'm taking the optimal assignment for v2. And now I'm looking at f of v2 minus f of v1. Okay. Now I know that that point is the optimal assignment for v2, so that's zero. For v1 is not the optimal assignment, so that's kind of a negative number. Could be zero by coincidence. So this difference has to be greater than equal to zero. That's the side. Now let's go to the other side. And here's the trick. We are at a maximum. So what do we know about the first order derivative? It has to be what? Zero. So when I take the difference of the two first order terms, they all go away. The only thing, remember, I'm a fixed assignment, so I'm, a I'm giving the same i to everybody, so there's no soup here anymore. This guy goes away, this guy goes away, this guy goes away, because that's just uh, the supply for whatever assignment you gave. And now, you only left over the second order term. And I always forget the sign, but at a minimum, what's the sign of the second order term? Huh? Negative, right? At a maximum, I'm sorry. What's the sign of the second order term? It's negative. So this is negative, but it's greater, this is equal to, this difference is just 
gradient to that, we just negative. So that's the proof. You cannot have a V2 function that gets a higher value than V1. Now, to prove that in, uh, in the general that we use here, takes, if you look at Fanny and Sonar, there are many, many there are chapters on that to get to the full proof. But that's just the question of doing the epsilons and deltas. Okay? Uh, but that's the stuff. And in fact, you can talk about very general solutions which are not even differentiable, so called viscosity solutions, and so on. It works for everything. So that's really useful because. I'm going to skip this stuff. I want to get to the comparison of solutions. And I want to show you, for instance, that the equilibrium price function increases when I lower the cost of, of going long. Remember, alpha plus is the inverse. So if it's increasing with alpha plus, it means it increases as the price of going long becomes smaller, because alpha plus is the inverse. Okay? The same thing with respect to alpha minus. Can we prove? And the proof is going to use the same comparison principle. So let's go through it. Okay, now that you understand the comparison principle. So, again, now I'm considering two different parameters, beta 1 and beta 2, because remember, I want to change alpha plus. Right? So two different parameters. And now I'm going to consider solutions, v1 with respect to parameter beta 1, and v2 with respect to parameter beta 2, and remind myself they both satisfy the same boundary condition. All I'm changing is alpha plus, I'm not changing the final value f of x. Okay. Now, I want to show that in order to show that v1 is greater angular than v2, it's enough to show that v2 is a subsolution of, of the initial PDE for beta 1. I just showed that f of v2 beta 1 is greater than equal to 0, which means v2 is a subsolution. Because now v2 is a subsolution, every subsolution lies below every super solution. Every solution is both a sub-solution and a super-solution, so every sub-solution lies below any solution. Are we okay here? That's all we have to do. Okay, it's fast, but that's what it is. If you want great thing, you do it. Now it's the proof. Okay. I know that uh, for the original parameter values, okay, I'm solving... I have to solve this equation, okay? Alpha minus sum of L I of V, that's the Demego supply equation for the original, for, for, any, for, any, for any parameter values that has to be satisfied. Now I'm gonna take some parameter values and take a new value, new set of parameters, where I raise the alpha plus for the new set. So what's gonna happen to those guys? These guys are gonna stay the same. These guys are the guys who go long. So now, once I replace that alpha plus, I get a number which is greater than equal to zero. It was zero, now it's greater than equal to zero. Now, if I now take the soup overall, this is for a particular location I start, I get a number greater than equal to zero. Now, if I take the maximum of all possible allocations, I'm also going to get greater than equal to zero, because if I have a number greater than equal to zero, the maximum has to be greater than equal to zero. There may be bigger maximums, bigger things, but I don't care. The max must be greater than to zero. And now I do the same. I divide by this, by, alpha, by, uh, by this constant. Uh, this continues to be greater than to zero because that's just, this is just a constant. Okay? And now I should have divided. There's a, there's a misprint here. This should be alpha pi, pi, but it doesn't matter. And then you plug in the definitions, and you obtain the fact that with the new parameters, this equation is going to be greater than to zero. And that says that the sub, this is a subsolution for the new PDE, and now we have this fact that V1 is less than equal to V2. So if we increase alpha plus, so all these pro properties use this, this principle, which is they are extremely useful. Okay. Um, now, what you have to do now in order to 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 talk about, sta you have to compare to talk about speculation, just like before, I have to think. What happens when you um, when you have to use just buy and hold strategies? You cannot buy in order to resell. You have to buy because you want to enjoy the dividends, the final dividends, which is just case at time t. Of course, that only makes sense with equity to s equal to a constant. Coming back, somebody who asked me about it was you who thought about s being a constant because with s constant, if you want to think about buy and hold strategies, what do you do if more people start selling? 
So we do that with S constant. Now, it's easy to prove formulas for, I'm not going to do to that, I call that the stationary price or the stationary static price. The, the P static, it's going to solve similar problems, except you think about the assignments of your views today. Okay, there are no, you know you're going to have to carry that thing. You have views today, other people have view, different views, and then you choose the groups that are going to go long, you choose the groups that are going to go short, you do the same thing as before. Okay? Now, it's easy also to solve the following. That says the cost of going long goes to, to zero. That remember, the cost is the inverse of alpha plus. As the cost of going long goes to zero, all that matters is the most optimistic person. Because the most optimistic person is going to buy everything. Okay, at zero cost, they're going to hold everything. No, that's not th that they would like to do it. That's the solution of this other problem. That's the solution of our earlier problem, right? Our earlier problem is exactly that. It's saying, look, I'm, uh, I'm retrained. That one is time consistent by construction. I retrain all the time how I want. This one is not. It's because that's what a buy and hold strategy is. It's by necessity, you can't retrain. So that one is not, you know, if I had a chance, I'd speculate. <laughs> then at time zero, that would change even my position at time zero because knowing that I have a chance in the future will make me change my position. That's what it is. So the difference, and this I'm close to conclude, the difference between that and the, and, the, and the stationary price is what you usually call a bubble. And there are two Porsche options for the long party. The long party keeps, if you are, if you're a long party, you can buy, you buy, when you buy, you keep an option to resell in the dynamic thing that you don't have in the station, in the, sta in the static thing, because you know you're not going to be allowed to resell. But if you're trading, if you're doing through the dynamic thing, you have two options. One is that you have the option to resell. When I buy today, I think, oh, I may be able to resell tomorrow. That's the option to resell. But you also have an option to delay. And this option to delay is the fact that I could say, look, instead of buying everything today, I can wait and buy the stuff tomorrow. Okay? Because I have a cost, an increasing cost of holding it. I may say, look, I'm going to save some cost today and get because I'm going to buy tomorrow at, more, uh, at a better price. Okay? So when this one makes the value of speculating bigger than, than, than the stationary price, this one makes the value of when you speculate smaller than stationary price because you're wanting to delay. Okay? Now, when agents are risk neutral and you have a constant marginal cost of going long, as you know, a buyer has to be indifferent about, about across the quantities he buys. So the delay option has no value. That's the Harrison and Krebs setup. There, the delay option has no value because they have constant marginal cost of going long. It's not the no shorting that does it. Okay? To get the option to resell to have value, all we need is that it's expensive to go short. If, it's, if, if shorting is free, you just wait and short when the prices, when you think the prices are too high. Okay? Now, there are corresponding shorts. But the crucial assumption in the early literature is shorting is costly and the marginal cost of going long is constant. It's not that there's no shorting. Okay. So now that you understand that, you can, you, can, you can build examples. And one example which is very easy to build is an example that says the following. Um, if you lower the cost of shorting, remember our compare statics here, If you lower the cost of shorting, okay. your price is going to increase. Remember, the price is decreasing in alpha minus, which means when you change alpha minus, you increase alpha minus, which is lowering the cost of shorting. It's always the inverse. You are increasing the price. Okay. You are decreasing, you are, you are decreasing the price. I'm sorry. You're decreasing the price. Sorry. You're decreasing the price. So, um, and then you can find examples. You can figure out examples. Where that, where this is exactly what happens, that you, as you lower the cost of shorting, you're going to decrease the price. And that is the explanation of what went on at that point. You get, and you can make actually the bubble negative. You can make the bubble negative because the delay option acquires such value that 
it's, it dominates the static price is smaller than the, the static price dominates the dynamic price, which means you get a negative bubble. So you can transform a positive bubble into a negative bubble just by just making the cost of shorting low enough, provided going long has a certain cost, which is clear in this case, that provided there's an increasing cost on the position of going long. As soon as you have that, it's very easy to produce. I'm not going to produce the, the I'm done with time, so I'm not going to give you guys the principal agent problem. I urge those of you who are interested, it's kind of a funny, funny problem that generates exactly the solution of the PDE, uh, but there's just too much material. And uh, I thank you guys for your attention. Uni's next. But we have a break. We have a half hour break. Okay. <laughs>